Uh, so the topic, uh, semantic integration with Apache Jenna and Stanball. Apache Jenna is a project from the Apache Software Foundation that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. As a Stanball, they're both part of the semantic web, semantic integration uh, approach that we're taking at Fogbeam. Uh, I'm going to try to stick to about 10 minutes on the theory part of which I've already burnt about three or four. Uh, I'll try to spend about 10 minutes on some examples and then about 25 minutes actually looking at code and uh, Q&A and the actual meaty technical stuff. So semantic integration, generally speaking, we're talking about integrating things. We want to let things talk to each other so they can be treated as a cohesive whole. Particularly here, we're talking about the idea of a semantic integration layer that binds things together at a knowledge level. So that's whether you've got relational database data from transactional apps, you know, your enterprise applications, your ERP system, your CRM system, your Salesforce system, e-commerce, whatever. You've got knowledge and document repositories. So you've got you know, Word documents, PDFs, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint documents, whatever. In a document management system, you may have blog servers, wiki servers, discussion forums, whatever. Uh, you've got stuff in a data lake or data warehouse using big data technology. You've got sensor data, possibly from an Internet of Things strategy. And you've got external data. And there I'm really talking about like open data. So if you're, if you're familiar with data.gov and the open data initiative, the linked data web, we're talking about pulling in data from outside as well. Uh, semantic integration particularly means we're using the semantic web stack, and we'll talk more about what that is in a moment to do this. Uh, we're using, you're using RDF and well-known and popular vocabularies as well as you may develop your own vocabulary. Uh, there's a relationship between this and like something like EAI or enterprise application integration. EAI is more what I would call the data and services level, and it's more about those transactional applications. So if you have EAI, your CRM system can update your Salesforce automation system. Okay, we can handle that, and that's important, and that's a good prerequisite to doing the stuff we're going to talk about here. If you have a thorough EAI environment, you have MDM, uh, that's Master Data Management for anybody who doesn't know that one. If you have EAI and MDM in place, you're ahead of the game. Uh, if you don't, you can still do the stuff we're talking about, but you'll be better off if you have uh, EAI, you're using a SOA approach, and you really have your enterprise applications integrated thoroughly. Uh, so, semantic web technology, what are we going to use that for exactly? Well, it lets us work with knowledge, not labels. And again, I'll expand a little bit more on what that means in a minute. You can express metadata about things. And by things, I mean entities, things that exist. Uh, either things that exist in any tangible real world, like a widget, widget ABC7946. You know, it might be a part number or a SKU that exists in the real world. Uh, a thing can also be a concept. So, you can express relationships between concepts. So, you might have a concept sports, and then a sub-concept might be football, sub-sub-concept American football, sub-sub-concept NFL football, and you can express the relationships between concepts and then attach those concepts to entities or, you know, tangible items, instances. Uh, and then once you've expressed all those relationships, it lets you do interesting things like find contextually related information. One of the examples I like to use, and we'll look at an actual example close to this, uh, if you're integrating with BPM using semantic web technology, you can have a screen where there's a user task that you need to complete. So you're a user, you've been tasked with something like approving a purchase order or approving a credit request. So you pull up that screen and there's a button you click that says approve request. But before you do that, there's some information you might want to consult first. Uh, a contextually relevant bit of information might be all the other people in your company who have done business with that customer. It might be your company's credit approval procedures manual. Even better, and this is where some of the open data stuff comes in, it might be a report from an EPA database showing that that company was just fined $5 billion for dumping benzene in the local river. So you can see how that might be relevant, right? You're going to approve a purchase order or make a decision, do I do business with this company or not, either as a vendor or as a supplier upstream or downstream. If they just got busted for dumping benzene in the river, you do business with them, that's a PR black eye for your company. So that's the example of the kind of thing that we can do. Uh, searching with greater precision, I'm not going to say any more about that right now, so we'll actually look at that one very pointedly in the demo section. You can actually generate new knowledge when you can do this kind of stuff. When you have this kind of thorough integration, because now you can cross link between domains in a way you couldn't do, at least not easily before. Uh, you might do big data analytics, predictive analytics against your transactional data. Okay, so I found a pattern in my transactional data when X is Y, my sales go up. But then if you can turn around and correlate that to external data, like uh, overall economic, you know, macroeconomic status uh, indicators from like the Bureau of Economic Research. You may be able to find a meta pattern that describes what happens to your company when something changes in the broader macro economy. 
So you can actually discover new knowledge that would have been unavailable to you otherwise. And there are other things, and that's what the uh, question marks are there for. So uh, we'll talk about data, information, and knowledge here. Uh, there's different ways of talking about that. One of the most popular models is something called DIKW. DIKW stands for data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. The idea is data is the lowest level. Information is sort of higher level. Knowledge is even higher. Wisdom is even higher. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to kind of move around within that stack and not really make a whole lot out of those distinctions. They do matter, uh, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm not, we're not going to sit here and talk a lot about ontology and uh, you know, epistemology and metaphysics today. Uh, so pointedly, what, uh, what's really important to us when we're talking about knowledge is data where you have unambiguous identifiers and you have some, some ontological information. So you have type class information and you have relationships between classes and things. So uh, what that means, if you have a unambiguous identifier, well, the word Java, J-A-V-A, a string literal, that is not an unambiguous identifier. It may seem unambiguous to you because you may be a Java programmer, and when you hear Java, your brain does some pattern matching, and you just automatically map that to Java, the programming language. But it may also mean a slang term for coffee. It may also mean an island in the South Pacific. So which one are you really talking about? So you need an uh, unambiguous identifier. The standard approach in the semantic web approach is to use URIs as identifiers. Um, usually the preferred approach is to use a URL uh, as the identifier. Even better if it's an HTTP URL and that URL actually resolves. So you can put it in a browser, hit enter and get a representation of that resource and that's like kind of the ideal scenario but it's not required. You can just use like a UUID. Uh, okay, so ontology, what we want to have are attributes and properties of a thing. So I'm talking about widget. I want to kind of know, well, what properties does a widget have? What is a widget and what things fall in the set of widgets? Uh, I also want to be able to express relationships between things. And the way you do that, there are properties like uh, the relation or relates to uh, property from the Dublin core vocabulary. There's the idea of subclass relationship, superclass relationship. There's a vocabulary called SCOS which lets you express those relationships between concepts. And that was like the football example from earlier, narrower and broader. You know, football is a n broader topic than American football. American football is a narrower topic than sports. All right, so a uh, little thing on the representation of data in this model. This is more like traditional relational database style data here. So you can kind of see how you know, a table works. You have rows or records. And then the metadata, so to speak, uh, is in the you know, schema of the table itself. So the ID, color, size, manufacturer stuff is you know, actually expressed in the table. Uh, the RDF approach is a little bit different. And that's where you get this idea of uh, what the subject predicate object model or a triple. So everything is a triple. And so to express uh, that same exact set of data, I have the unambiguous identifier. So UID colon 2345 is the identifier for that thing. But then I say UUID 2345 has type thing. Uh, later I say UUID 2345 has color blue. Then UUID 2345 has manufacturer 9998. And unfortunately the screen resolution is messed up here so you can't see what's below that. But I actually define that UUID 9998 refers to another entity. So one point that I wanted to make about this is the object part of a triple can either be a literal like this, so it's just a string, it's just a literal, or it can point to another resource. So if you understand that triple representation, you're halfway there to understanding the whole semantic web approach because that's kind of the core abstraction. Uh, the semantic web stack lets you do other things like expressing again superclass, subclass relationships, domain and range relationships between properties and classes. You can say this class is equivalent to this class uh, you can say this thing is the same as this thing, and that comes in handy when you're merging data sets. We probably won't have time to get into that. Uh, you can express disjoint sets. You can say this class and this class can't share any common members, or something can't be members of both. Uh, again, SCOS lets you do some other things like narrower and broader. It lets you do ordered collections. Uh, but we're not going to talk anymore about epistemology or metaphysics, so we're going to stop there. There's a lot more you can say about the ontological modeling, semantic modeling. Uh, so again, from a synonyms perspective, I'm going to kind of use knowledge and what I like to call smart data. 
and semantic data is kind of meaning the same thing. And so, so to go back to what I said before, those three things to me is data that has the type information and the ontology information that defines relationships and classes. If you have those three things in self-describing format using you know, RDF and using uh, popular vocabularies and ontologies, then that's what I call smart data. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about doing is building a semantic integration layer. So what a semantic integration layer does is it lets you take data from an enterprise application, again, your ERP or CRM, your document repositories, you know, it's analytics and things that are in a data lake, sensor data from an M2M or IoT environment, your open data stuff, your e, you know, EPA data from the government. Standball is a semantic processing engine, and we'll look at it in more depth in a minute, that can extract semantic structure meaning from these other things. It's especially good at working with uh, free text, and we'll actually see an example of that in a moment. So Standball will take that data, extract the semantic data, put it in the Jenna triple store, and then users, my line disappeared, but users can query the Jenna store. You can also have applications query the Jenna store to do uh, cool stuff. Uh, specifically about getting triples out of a relational database, there's a separate protocol called R2RML, and there's an open source implementation of that called D2RQ. Uh, we don't have time to talk about that today. There's also a project called NE23, which is anything to triples, which is an Apache project that is pointedly about extracting from like HTML that has been annotated with microdata, microformats, RDFA, and those things, and turns that into triples that you can load into a, a triple store. Uh, if you're gonna extract structured data from other sources, you might also fall back to tools like OpenRefine, the Apache Tika library, the JSOUP library, which is an HTML parser, and something like Boilerpipe. Boilerpipe, for anybody that's not familiar, will let you take an HTML page and it will try to extract just the meaningful part, the text that's the actual body of the page. It'll take out like any framing that's around the edges, like where the ads and the headers and footers are. Uh, so. Are they producing triples? Uh, no, you would have to then turn around and do some additional processing there. Uh, so I'm gonna skip over some of this stuff. Uh, I'll just show you this picture real quick. This is kind of the vision of how the semantic web stack works at the base, you know, your URIs. Forget about XML, that's actually a historical legacy. A lot of people have this mindset that the semantic web is somehow equivalent to XML or depends on XML. That is no longer true if it ever was true. Very few people that are doing anything are using XML as an encoding for RDF. The standard now is Turtle or N3. So you kind of forget that. It's still there and it still works, but you're not gonna use it. But RDF is the abstract data model and you can transform in and out of any of those representations. So you can load data that's been serialized as RDF XML and serialize it out as JSON LD or as uh, N3 or Turtle. And then RDFS and OWL and Sparkle are really what lets you query your RDF data using that ontological information and do like inference and generate new triples. Uh, the rest of this stuff is like advanced topics that we won't get to today. All right, so uh, that's just a quick uh, overview of how the triple relationship works. So the, basically, we've already seen that you have a subject, a predicate or property, and an object or value. That is the abstract data model behind all this. So if you understand that, you really are halfway there. Um, some of this I'm gonna skip over a little bit. These slides will be available, by the way. There's also a bunch of sample code that I wrote for a talk I did at TriJug Monday night that shows how to actually do a lot of this stuff using the Jenna API. Uh, and I'll make that available to you as well. Uh, so semantic integration in enterprise can be used to support knowledge management, collaboration, BPM, business intelligence, predictive analytics. It can make all those things better. Uh, Jenna is an RDF API, it's a triple store, it's the Sparkle query engine, it's the OWL reasoner. There's also an endpoint that lets you expose Sparkle over the remote Sparkle protocol, which we won't have time to talk about. It's at jenna.apache.org, so you can go look that up and find out more there if you feel the urge. Uh, Standball, again, is a RESTful engine that you send it text and it will give you back triples. And we'll actually see that live here in a minute. Uh, that's at standball.apache.org. It can also do other things. Uh, the REST enhancer protocol is stateless. It doesn't store anything, but there is a model called the content hub where you send it content, it actually stores the content along with the triple. So you can then query Stanball and say, hey, Stanball, given this Sparkle query, give me back the documents that I sent you that match. 
Uh, you can also implement that, implement that kind of model yourself out of band, which is what we do. Uh, and one last point about this, a lot of people equate the semantic web and AI. And there is some connection there. But it is not the case that we have to have artificial general intelligence for the semantic web to be useful. The semantic web is already there. It is useful today. You probably use it a lot more than you realize because Google and Yahoo and the other uh, indexes are actually using semantic data when they can find it to do things. Like the rich snippets that Google shows you for like Yelp results, they're actually extracting semantic data that's in RDFA and micro formats uh, or micro data format and using that to enhance their search results. So semantic web, if you've heard some criticisms of it, you've heard people say semantic web will never come to pass or it doesn't exist. Yes, actually it does. It already exists and is already being used. But we don't have to have AGI, but there is that overlap where the reasoning engines, the inference engines, as they get smarter, then they'll be able to do more things and do more things more efficiently. So uh, with Jenna, you can plug in your own reasoners. And with Stanball, you can plug in your own extractors. All right, so that's it for the slides. Let's look at how some of this stuff actually works in real life. So at Fogbeam, we have a product called Quadi. It's an enterprise social network. Now, this competes with things like Jive Software's products or Yammer, uh, Lithium, uh, some of those kinds of things. But one of the things we're doing that we think is different and better is we actually have this semantic web approach built in. So you can see here earlier, I pasted in a, uh, or wrote a little status update. Okay, in and of itself, that's cool. I can do things like, you know, hey, who wants to have Thai for lunch tomorrow? I can share that with my friends. People can reply. We can coordinate going to have Thai for lunch. That's useful. You can also do that via email. So what we've done is try to add some additional functionality that really makes it more useful. So let's put in some text. Quadi can now recognize celebrities like Bob Marley. I'm getting, unfortunately, my screen resolution thing here is off a little bit. So this time, you see something extra happened. What we did, we actually sent that string to Stanball over rest and got back some triples. And what the triples told us were things like a description of who Bob Marley is. And we also got back a link. And what that link is, and we automatically turned that string into a hyperlink, it's a link to DBpedia. For anybody who's not familiar, DBpedia is kind of a pure project to Wikipedia. It's a crowdsourced initiative to take data from uh, Wikipedia and put it in a structured format using RDF and the semantic web. So you can actually query DBpedia data using Sparkle. And there is a remote protocol implementation at dbpedia.org. So you can actually write Sparkle queries in Jenna and send them over HTTP and query DBpedia. In our case, though, all we do is just uh, do that semantic extraction and get back all these triples. So we only expose the one, right? So we got back that description that was actually right here. So we turn it into a tooltip, which is useful in its way. And we give you the link, but we also stored all those other triples. And I'll explain why that's important in a minute. Let me just point out one thing. Somewhere if you look here, you'll see that one of the things we know about Bob Marley is, well, actually, it's right here. So we know that he's a musical artist. You know, his occupation or his genre is there. Uh, we also know things like he was a ska artist or a, a reggae artist. Okay. So that's DBpedia data. That's useful. What about your own data? What if you want to integrate your company's data? Well, there's a REST API for Stanball called the Entity Hub that lets you add your own data. So if we do something like... I made up the fictitious company Boxer Steel. It's like the Acme widgets from the Roadrunner cartoons or whatever, I guess. Okay, so again, we recognize that because I put it in the Stanball uh, site. And so again, we put the description in there as a tooltip. That's just a little handy thing. So you can say, oh, what is this? This time, though, you see there's a hyperlink, but it's not to DBpedia anymore. In this case, we actually made it a hyperlink to, and this will put me in a login page because I don't have a stored login cookie, but it put me right in our CRM system. And this is actually our live Fogbeam CRM. I actually put this fictitious customer in there. So we can do that kind of thing with local knowledge. And that could be anything. It could be a customer number, a part number. Uh, it could be a user. And we could auto, auto link you to that user's profile and let you find out more about that user and what they know, et cetera. All right, so I said earlier that Sparkle and the semantic web approach let you query things in a better way. So let's add a couple more uh, things here. So let's say we can now recognize celebrities like Richard Marks. And just for good measure, let's add another one. Let's talk about John Bon Jovi. All right, so 
what do John Bon Jovi, Richard Marx, and Bob Marley have in common? Yeah, they're all musicians. So let's say I had sold the system to a record label or a music company, or somebody has something to do with music, so this is actually a relevant example. You want to query and say, show me all the posts where people mention musicians. Well, using current search technology, how would you do that? You would have to basically enumerate a list of every musician in the existence, and you would have to go search for every one of them painstakingly one by one by one by one, which would take you like 900 years and you'd be dead before you finished, and the list would be out of date. Uh, but because we stored all that semantic information, what we can do now, let me copy and paste this into my thing instead of uh, trying to write the Sparkle query by hand. I can write a query using the Sparkle query language. And I'll say a little bit more about this in a second, because in real life, you would never ask actual users to write Sparkle. But let me just show you what it can do first. So I can write a query. Let me kind of explain it a little bit. You can say, select entity where the Dublin Core references uh, property is there that points to some other entity where that entity has RDF type musical artist. So we're saying, show me every post that mentions an entity and where that entity has type musical artist. And we can come here and say search. We'll run as a Sparkle search. And there we go. We got back Bob Marley, Richard Marks, and John Bon Jovi. So it lets you search by that semantic information. So that alone is a whole different thing than just pure keyword search. We're actually searching on concepts and semantic information now. Uh, the thing, other thing I'll add is that in real life, Users are not going to write that. That looks ugly as hell. I write this stuff every day, and I don't like writing it. What we want to be able to do is let users say something like this. All right, we don't have it today, so I can't actually do that and show it to you and show it working. But what I can show you is that there are projects out there, and we're going to be integrating one of these shortly. Uh, and this stuff is also open source. It's not stuff we built. It's stuff from the community. But this uh, Quepi will turn natural language queries into Sparkle. Uh, that's one of a couple of projects out there that do that. You can also use something called Auto Sparkle. So over time, we'll be integrating that so that you can just say, you know, show me posts that mention musicians, and you don't have to write Sparkle queries. OK, so one last example, and then we'll try to jump over and look at some code, which we'll have about 10 minutes to do or so. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Where was my other? Oh, let me go back to the front page. So I mentioned that BPM example. So we actually do integrate with BPM servers. So I already have a stored task in the system from earlier. So this is a user task. So this is something that I've been assigned to do, complete a uh, purchase order. So if I come here and click complete, this isn't actually completing it yet. It's taking me to the complete screen. So what the system can do, because it has that semantic knowledge, it has the type of the event, in which in this case is something like purchase order approval. Yeah. Uh, buried behind the scenes is a customer number. I don't surface it on this screen, but there's a customer number there as well. So what the system was able to do, it was able to say, oh, here's that link to the CRM system for the customer that's involved in this purchase order. It was also able to say, oh, test user one has knowledge specifically related to this topic. So it was able to give me the link to test user one who I might want to consult. Uh, and then it was also able to find all the posts that mention this customer. So if I click here, it takes me right to, so now I can see what are the other conversations going on in my company around this topic. Now, you might think, okay, Phil, that's very cool technically, but what, what good is that? You know, how would I have to use that for anything? An example I'd like to use is this. And th you have to keep in mind, this technology is meant for larger companies, the kind of companies that are larger than Dunbar's number. You know, you're up to like 200, you know, 250 or more people. You're at a point where no longer can everybody in the company know everybody else, and especially you can't know everybody else on a first name basis, and you can't know what everybody else is doing, especially by the time you get to say a thousand employees or more. Now you have a situation where the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, as they say, right? So you have a situation where Bob in Division A is looking for widgets, and he has gotten a price from a vendor of two dollars a widget. And Jim in Division X, on the other hand, is paying like six dollars a widget for the same widgets or an equivalent widget. So if this guy knew this guy existed and knew he was negotiating for the same widget, he could call him and say, hey, Bob, you know, let's get in on the same deal. And now you're saving $4 a widget for every widget you buy. But because this guy doesn't even know this guy exists, much less does he know he's looking for the same widgets, they never talk. 
So this guy gets ripped off for $4 a widget for every widget he buys. And if he buys enough widgets, that can be real money. So if they were using this kind of system, and if you were also pulling that semantic knowledge out of those other documents, you know, purchase-related documents, contracts, those other things, now when this guy Jim pulls something up, he can say, you know, show me about this widget, and maybe one of the results is going to be a purchase order that we submitted to vendor Z that shows, oh, it is possible to get my widget for $2 a widget. And now he can say, oh, well, I should just jump in on this deal instead of paying this other vendor. So that's a uh, scenario for how this is actually useful in the real world. It's just one of many. Uh, I'll leave it to your imagination somewhat to think through the other possible scenarios. But that's what we do. And I promised there'd be live code, so let's actually look a little bit how this is implemented. I won't be able to explain it in excruciating detail, but well, actually, before I do that, let me actually show you a little bit more about Stanball, just so you kind of see what's going on. Um, <coughs> let me get rid of some of these other tabs real quick. Somewhere here, I have a tab open already with Stanball, my live demo instance. So here you go, this is the web interface to Stanball. Uh, you can do everything that you can do on this web interface. So it's a REST based protocol, but they give you a convenient web form based interface so you can prototype and experiment. So if we hit the enhancer, we can put in some of that text. And we can actually put in that same text. We can say, uh, we can now recognize Bob Marley. And you can actually see what we'll uh, get back, except I can't get to my I can't get to the submit button because my thing is off the edge of the screen. And that's a text box. I can't just uh, hit enter. Can you drag the whole window? Do what? Drag it the whole browser window? Yeah, that's, oops. All right, so. You can see that what we get back was, you know, again, that DBpedia link and, you know, a little bit of information Bob Marley. And then in JSON LD format, we got all of those triples that tell us everything we might want to know about Bob Marley. Now, just to illustrate a little bit about what more you can do with this. Just, uh, I did, 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 uh, lost my toolbar. Hello. Let's uh, put in something a little bit more interesting, like let's go to San Jose in California. So because we get back all that semantic information about those entities, and that includes things like you know uh, the longitude and latitude, we can actually like do a mashup with like OpenStreetMaps data or something or mapping data and show you on the map a visual representation of the places and the things you're talking about. So there's a lot of stuff you can do when you have uh, that semantic information available to you. All right, so I promised code, so let me get back to that. So this is the status controller. This is all Groovy code. If you don't know Groovy, uh, just bear with me. It's relatively easy to read. Uh, so whenever somebody submits a new status or a little post, what we do is just uh, set up a REST client instance. And this font is actually too big. I made it bigger for TriJug the other night so people could see. I uh, just set up an instance of REST client, and then we submit via a post the, that string, and we send it to that enhancer URL. And then Stanball gives us back the uh, JSON LD in this object. And we pull it out, do some stuff with it, and ultimately wind up with a string. And then we attach that string and inject that into our HTML. And the way we in inject it into the HTML is we just create an empty script tag, put that JSON in there, since JSON LD is valid JavaScript syntax, and the browser will just ignore it. <clears throat> and we attach an ID to the empty script element that we can reference. And we have some JavaScript code that loops over all the matching elements on the page that have this text annotation associated with them and they find the corresponding strings and do all the <coughs> tool tipping and everything. 
Uh, so once we get back to JSON LD, then we have the automatic tool tipping and stuff is done in JavaScript. Uh, then we also send a JMS message to our indexer service that does things like uh, indexing for text search into Lucene and then indexing into Jenna for uh, the semantic updates. Let me, there's some beta code in here if you haven't noticed, so just pretend you didn't see that. Somewhere down here we, further down than I thought. Yeah, here we go. So we pull that enhancement JSON back out of the database where it was associated with the object that we stored to represent that status update. We create an empty Jenna model object. We use a string reader in the RDF data manager to pull those JSON triples back into a model. Then we create a TDB data set where TDB is the persistent data set that actually stores to disk. And then we open a transaction and then we insert everything from the JSON into our TDB model. And there's a little bit extra work we do here. What we're doing here is saying the status update, you know, so the thing that we have that's in our domain that we have an identifier for, put a triple in for every one of those uh, semantic triples from the JSON that says DC references. So that's how we were able to say this post that's in our database with ID, you know, UUID 12397674 or whatever has that DC references term that references to like Bob Marley. So we have to inject uh, triples for that. And then we merge those models and do a commit. And that's how we store that semantic knowledge in our local triple store so we can get to it later. Uh, and then if you look at this activity BPM controller, so whenever you click that uh, complete task button, this is the code that executes. And so all we do here is just a series of Sparkle queries. So we go in. Somewhere down here, here we go. Uh, we load our triple store. We start a read transaction this time, so we're not gonna actually update anything. Uh, we automatically attach some prefixes for some of those vocabularies, so you don't have to type those in. Uh, well, in this case, it's purely a programmatic query. What I mean to say is when you do that Sparkle query from the search box, you don't have to put all those ugly looking prefixes in, because we attach a lot of this for you behind the scenes. But we set up a Sparkle query Uh, in this case, you can see what we're searching for is that has expertise uh, predicate. So anybody who has expertise related to, and then it would be that customer number. Uh, we execute the Sparkle query, it gives us back a set of results. We loop over those results. And then that subject of that uh, subject predicate object triple is our UUID. So we have to extract that UUID back out, which is what we do here. So it's in the form of quad E colon and then it's a UUID. So we just extract it back out, strip off the quad E colon part, and then we do a search you know, by UUID for that user. Uh, in this case, we're searching for user and it's the same way when we're searching for other posts or when we're searching for uh, whatever. So we use that pattern multiple times to search for things that might be related contextually. Here's where we're searching for entities that have that internal link attribute. That's how we got that CRM link earlier. Uh, so that's most of the good stuff. Uh, I think we're roughly out of time, so why don't I stop talking and just see if anybody has questions, and I'll try to answer a few if I can, if anybody has any. Yeah. How would you relate that to uh, Solar? <sighs> it's interesting. Solar lets you do just strictly keyword search. So. Solar lets you search for, say, the literal string Bob Marley. But again, if you have a solar index, and let's say you've got John Bon Jovi, Richard Marks, and Bob Marley in your solar index, you would have to search three separate times, enumerating each of those three strings that you're interested in. Now, you can do wildcard text search with solar, but there's no semantic knowledge built into solar. This lets you, as long as you have that relationship data in your triple store, unless you search, you know, at a conceptual level. But here's the thing. Uh, earlier I showed you how triples can have as their object a literal, a string literal. So you can actually combine Lucene or Solar with Jenna so that when you want to search for triples, you can search against the literals in the object field and do free text search. So you can actually combine the approaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a relationship 
yeah, you make a good point. There is a relationship between the stuff we're doing here and like the faceted search that you can do with something like solar. Uh, I would argue that this is a richer, uh, more expressive version of that. So with facets, you're limited to, I mean, you can have like a list of facets. You can have price, manufacturer, and location or something. And you can say, I want price between zero to 100, manufacturer, Samsung or Nokia, and manufacturer location, China or Russia. Right, so you can do that. But what you can't do there is say anything about those relationships. So you can't say, find me anything manufactured in a country that is a NATO country or a Warsaw Pact country. If you had it in a triple store and you had those triples defining those relationships, then you could say, find me everything manufactured by a Warsaw Pact country, which is a richer model. Now, that's a made up example and you could argue, well, that isn't useful for anything. And that particular example might not be, but that's the difference between being able to use uh, triple store and semantic search and just text search. The other thing you can do, and I didn't do up an example to show this off, but with Jenna, you can search, you can ask questions and get back answers where you never stated the answer explicitly. So it's actually doing inference. So if there's an inference can, can be inferred logically from the existing triples, then the owl reasoner will infer those triples and then it will return those to you if it finds something matching. So even though you never said X is equal to Y, it will still return to you X and Y if it's a valid assertion. And if we had more time, I could demo something for you for that. But uh, you can do things like a domain and range relationship. You can say X has property Y where Y has you know, domain bar. Well, then when you find an instance of this guy because he has this property, even though you never declared a type for this entity, because it has that property and that property has the domain bar, this thing has to be of type bar because it's a logical inference that has to hold, or, the, or either that or your schema is not valid. Yeah. So um, one of the things that you have to worry about with relational database eventually is your query optimizing optimizations mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And this, to some degree, I imagine, is set logic underneath eventually, mm -hmm. but it's still the same thing of how do you get into the nuts and bolts and optimize and... So that's something that is, is totally a valid point, and it's not as mature yet in terms of you know, the body of knowledge of how do I optimize my queries. Uh, but there is some knowledge out there. You know, there are known patterns that are slower to query than others. One thing I can tell you is that if you rely on a lot of inferred triples and you demand a lot of the inference engine, it's going to be slower. There is another element to consider. I talked about OWL a little bit. There are three different versions of OWL. And the subsequent higher versions are more expressive in terms of you can express richer relationships. Uh, but as you go higher up that stack, it becomes more expensive to calculate all those inferred triples. And the highest level of OWL, what's called OWL full, is uh, something is called not decidable, which in computer science or ontological terms means that you can ask questions that the system can't answer. I mean, it can't tell you it can't answer them. In other words, it, it reduces to Goodell's incompleteness theorem at some level. The system literally can't tell you whether or not there's an answer, and it can't even tell you whether or not it's capable of telling you. you know, so, uh, yeah, owl fool is the most expressive version of owl, but it also is not decidable. So you have to fall back to a probabilistic approach there. Uh, there was another question here. Uh, you mean like disambiguation? So I've got like, do what? Yeah, so a couple of different ways. And it falls back to the existing body of work on named entity recognition and um, automatic entity linking. But if you have a literal collision, like my document, maybe in one place uses the word Java to mean Java to language. And in the same document, it uses the word Java to mean the island in the South Pacific. Like, hey, Phil, we're going we're gonna to send you to Java to write Java code. Okay. Right now, Stanball will probably not do the right thing. It will probably wind up picking one or the other, uh, and it'll pick the one it thinks is most relevant based on the overall context of the document. So that's where, like I said, we don't yet have, like, general purpose strong AI. This is not going to be as good as a human. But what it will do in that case, it will actually give you back both answers. Uh, and it will give you back both answers with a probability score, it's just that in that particular case, I have a feeling what would happen. You would get back one or the other with like a 0.98 or something, and the other one with like a 0.2 or something, so just based on my experience. Yeah, to do some 
Yeah, and that's where, like I said, you can write your own extractors and over time, Sandball is a relatively young project uh, and what I believe uh, and what I'm kind of betting on because I'm building a business around doing this is that the extractors will get better and we're working on some things that fog beams I can't really talk about yet but you know, we've got our own ideas about how we think we can improve that extraction and deal with that disambiguation problem. Uh, but it's just basically more applications of machine learning. Uh, some of it you can do by doing additional pre-processing of the data set and you know, uh, upfront cl uh, clustering classification. So you can use something like Mahout and run a standard clustering algorithm like k-means or whatever. And if you've clustered those documents uh, or done classification against them, against a training data set, now when your extractor runs, it's able to use that additional context to do a better job of disambiguating the entities. Uh, we haven't built that part yet, but that's on our to-do list where we're trying to take the open source. And I, just to be clear, our version will be fully open source as well. Everything we do is 100% open source. We're not doing open core or anything. But we will take the base Apache Stanball project and we've got our own ideas for things we're going to add to try to improve the extraction. Those things will in turn be contributed back to the original project, but you know, we've got some things that we're experimenting with. Anybody else? Yeah, there's really three major things. And, well, actually, probably the, the best answer I can give you is go to schema.org. Um, schema.org is a, an initiative put together by a bunch of the major uh, web search engines like Google and Yahoo and Microsoft. And I think all the major players are on board. And they define some standard schemas for expressing uh, entities and attributes and relationships and microdata, microformats, which are similar but not exactly the same thing, and something called RDFA are three different approaches to plugging in that kind of semantic information into HTML documents. So if you've got valid microformats, microdata, or RDFA in a HTML document, then something like any 2.3 can automatically extract that structure information and make it triples. So any of RDFA, microdata, microformats, those are the three approaches. And they're all perfectly valid and they have different strengths and weaknesses, but we don't have time to go into all the, uh, the nitty gritty, but that's yeah, they're all triple friendly, and at the end of the day, they will all convert to triples. Yeah. Uh, where are the slides going to be at? Uh, I don't know yet. Uh, I know the organizers of ATO asked me to send them the slides, so my assumption is they're going to put all of the slides for all the talks on the ATO site. Um, I didn't think to actually verify that though, but the fact they asked me to provide the slides so they could distribute them implies they're going to put them on their website. But if you know for a fact you want the slides and you have a card or something, just I can arrange with you before we leave here to make sure you get them okay, if you cool. really want them. Uh, or you can go to fogbeam.com and there's a link on there called semantic underscore web underscore links, I think, and I'll make sure they're on there. Okay. All right.